I would first like to say greetings to all fellow historians and tell you a little bit about what we are going to do here today. In my humble way, I would like to show you the artifact and then the corresponding piece of equipment that we use in reenacting. What you're looking at right here in this uh, artifact collection are the busted caps off of a musket, like a sharp 54 caliber percussion carving. And the caps that went on a pistol like this cylinder were very small, very small. And they went on each nipple and before anything could be fired. And so <clears throat> those caps are very small and could be overlooked very easily. And the percussion caps that are found at on the actual site, these are the musket type caps, not for a pistol like here. You see how this cap is kind of flanged out and when fired, it would just go every direction like what these did right here. <clears throat> so when these caps were found, uh, they've been fired. They've been fired. And this is what they look like. Uh, when we use it for reenacting, this is what they look like right here. And the percussion caps off of a, a, a revolver. I'm going to call them revolvers because the cylinder, when revolved, pistols could be you called even one shot pistols. One shot and you're done. But a revolver had six shots, and so very hard to load, very hard to load. So that's why they carried usually more than one, one revolver. It's an amazing collection of artifacts. And looking at, at these artifacts, I'm going to go through a lot of the artifacts first and then show you the corresponding article that we would use in reenacting. And all our reenacting equipment is reproductions of the actual thing. In this book, uh, we found the lost Sand Creek site. A lot of the book is devoted to these artifacts <clears throat> and to re regress a, a little bit. I'd like to talk about the percussion caps. The percussion caps are a primer system that was invented by different uh, gun man manufacturers. There were so many gun man manufacturers at this time, so many. Uh, Colt, Remington, Smith & Wesson, I mean the list goes on and on where the battle monument stands today, mm -hmm. it would have been up that, up the creek, at least two or three miles, at least that far, at least that far. You could have found percussion caps from that point all the way up the creek for seven miles and even, even east, two, three miles. You know, to find these percussion caps would be a feat in itself, but to find a percussion cap 
And how many people will even know what they are when they first find them? But they're metal. They're metal, absolutely. And they were the system used to ignite the black powder and, mm. and a weapon. First a spark, the hammer would hit the uh, cap, send the spark down a little tube, ignite the black powder, and then that would shoot or force the projectile through the barrel. Boy, to find these caps, that's amazing. Just, just to find a cap, just to show you the, the comparison. There's that, that small for the pistols, and a little easier to handle for the muskets. Uh, sharp carbines, some were percussion and used that type of cap. And in the book, they talk a lot about percussion, sharp carbines that were used. So it makes a lot of sense to a reenactor like myself that you'd find the uh, percussion caps like this, but you gotta know what you're looking for. And you gotta know what you what these are when you see them. You know, oh, it's just a little speck of metal and throw it away, uh-uh, uh-uh. That tells you a whole story of what was fired, who fired it, where. One thing about the buttons. Out, out there at that time, the buttons could have come off of any number of uniform garments, any number of things at that time they could have been wearing. The, uh, the buttons that are talked about in this book are military and sure there were civilian bu buttons too. The coat that uh, was worn at that time here in the West was called a four button sack coat. What I'm wearing now is called a sack coat. And that's just what it implies. It was a sack. <laughs> and so they, they made them fit them. The sack coat was used primarily at, sack co at Sand Creek by even Colorado militia and the volunteers. The buttons of a, of a sack coat all were about seven eighths of an inch in diameter. And they were stamped with the national emblem of, of the eagle. And in his right claw, in, he was grasping the, the wreath in his right claw. And in his left one, he had three arrows. And then sometimes, not every time, there was a, a letter on the, on the button. Not all the time, sometimes. But if we had a letter <clears throat> like I, well, for infantry, if it had a C, well, what do you think that was? Cavalry. Hmm. A, artillery. And as we go through these artifacts, we're gonna work our way up to the one artifact that was found at Sand Creek. And because of that one artifact, it's why we're here today. It was the most important artifact and the most defining artifact of, of Sand Creek. I was involved with the horse cavalry and I started 20 years ago at a place called Fort Riley, Kansas, is where I started. Well, actually before that, I actually got started <clears throat> doing cavalry instructing 
at Bent's old fort as, as a dragoon in the dragoons, mounted dragoons. And then from Fort Riley, I went on to do reenactments. Little Big Horn, Washita, Sand Creek, the Kidder Massacre, uh, just to name a few. But the, the reenacting, we, we, uh, a better term than reenacted. I, I use sometimes living history, living history. That's when we try to be very authentic in our, our dress and our uniforms, in our equipment, in our mannerism also. That's living history. So that when we talk to people about living history and reenacting, you know, we tell the truth. The truth is what this is all about, the truth. Some people don't like the truth. I want to talk to you about a lot of these artifacts and how we use reenacting gear, authentic gear to, in our world of living history. And we're gonna work up to the last item, which is the most important, the most important item, which is the very defined definition of why we're here. And so hang on for that one. The cavalry spur, the cavalry spur for the enlisted man uh, is very uh, recognizable. This is a cavalry spur right here. Right. That's a cavalry enlisted man's spur. And in the reenact, reenacting world, here's what we use. They're pretty close. They're very close. So we use this spur in reenacting. This is the spur that was found at the actual site. Then, now, then, now, the cavalry enlisted man spur, and it went right on, on your boots, like so. Even the boots that we use in reenacting have to follow regulations to be accurate. The carbine swivel right here, <clears throat> which is what we use today. Here's the carbine swivel right here. Look at that swivel and look at this one. Then, now, this was a spring lever right here. It hooked onto your leather carbine sling and was worn around your body in reenacting. See the see the the chain link right there and the, and the swivel. Here it is, right there. Same thing, same thing. But this is a reproduction. This is the same thing as this. At that time, cavalry, cavalry men, the, the thinking was, you kept all your weapons on you, and on yourself, because if you got knocked off your horse and your weapons were on your horse, you're just out there by yourself with unarmed. So the thinking was keep all your weapons on your body. And this is called a carbine sling. See how that opens up right there?
on every carbine on the ins or inside of the carbine or on the left side of the carbine was a ring attached to a carbine sling bar and that ring held up there and you snap this into the ring of that carbine and that carbine would just hang on your side and you take the barrel and stuff it into a, a carbine thimble that was on your stirrup. A little uncomfortable, but you got used to it. The best is yet to come. Also found out there at the Sand Creek was now on the canteen. This is a, a cavalry canteen, which went through many adaptions or changes over the years. They first started out yeah, made of wood. <laughs> Can you imagine wood? And then they later became on, underneath this cloth, which happens to be blue. They were different colors, blue for federal. And the South had their, their colors. At Sand Creek, they didn't find any canteens. With the cloth on them, they found some of the stoppers. They found those, that's what this is. So when Phil would hold approximately a quart and a half of water, and when, when Phil weighed almost seven to eight pounds, that's the stopper that went on the top of a, of a canteen. That's exactly what that is. So, and it would be very easy to lose these, you know, very easy to lose them. Yeah, even harder to find them, even for harder to find them and to know what you were looking at when you saw it. So, again, that's, that's the top part that would fit into a cork and go into the top of a, of a canteen like this. Exactly, exactly the same. Only this is a reproduction. This would go right here in the cork. And then the cork would go in the top of the canteen. You ever see that? <clears throat> Anything metal would be could be picked up with a metal detector if you knew what the what this was when you found it. And the top of the came on uh, canteen would go into the cork, go into the top of the canteen like that. And that's exactly that is then now so this is history this is history I mean to actually see history to touch it and feel it is amazing you're actually touching history with this collection with this artifacts you're actually touching history and bringing it to life, to have some meaning. And we'll get to that one item, that one artifact that puts us all together, puts it all together. <clears throat> so here's your top of your canteen cork stopper right there. You'll notice that uh, a lot of these bullets are round, completely round. And some bullets are conical. And they have a, a 
ring around the base of the bow. Let me get this so you can see those. Oh, I hope you can see those rings on these bolts. There's some bullets here where the rings are a little more pronounced. This bolt that was found, look at the, uh, the rings around the base of the bolt. What did those rings do? What does those rings mean? Well, if you also look at the bottom of the bolt, can you see the bottom, how hollow that is? When, when the bolt is rammed into the weapon and rammed down, that hollow part is sitting over an amount of black powder. And then a percussion cap, like we talked about. Uh, well, the pistol. The revolvers had a percussion cap right there. So this bullet would have been rammed down into, rammed down into the cylinder. <clears throat> Far enough so that this could turn and not get caught. And it had a prescribed amount of black powder in, in there. So when the hammer came down and hit that percussion cap and sent that spark down, and it ignited the black powder and shot this bolt out. But before we get into that flying bolt, and if you look at this bullet, okay, that the bottom of that bullet is hollow. So when, when the gunpowder explodes, it expands this bullet and then those grooves in the bullet go into a rifling that's inside the barrel of that weapon. And you all know when you throw a football, what's a football anyway? Uh, a football, when you throw a football and it just goes out everywhere, you're lucky to hit the target, but if you throw a perfect spiral, you'll probably get where you're throwing, right? And that's what this bullet does. It expands into those grooves, into the barrel, and comes out twisting, twisting. Yeah, just like that. That's what these are. That's amazing what these bullets are. Uh, some of them are deformed where they hit something. Some of these are around, around buff balls. And we'll get into those in just a minute. See this bullet right here? See how deformed this one is? That one right there, it hit something. And it was real deformed. There's no telling, no telling what that hit. They're all <clears throat> 44 caliber bullets, 44 caliber, which is close to a half an inch. Can you imagine a half inch bullet hitting you like that? This gun wrench, <clears throat> this was kind of a combination, combination. Uh, My gun wrench doesn't look anything like this, <clears throat> but I looked this this gun wrench up in some old books, and this this is the wrench part right there at the tip of it. Is that's the wrench part? So on on a musket where the percussion nipple was, they could take this and turn that and loosen it up, take it off, clean it, 
and on a sharp carbine, which had that big per percussion nipple screwed in, that's what they, they could have used that for, and took that nipple off with this. This would have been very easy to lose, very easy to lose. That's what this is, and it opened that rim, that nipple, much, much smaller. It, it fits a revolver here. And if I want to take a nipple out and clean it or change it, I can take this here and slide this over that and turn it out like this. It was, see there's a rectangle shape right there that would fit over these percussion caps. And I could take my hoops from taking that one out now. And uh, it would screw them out. And if I want to put them back in, I could set it in there, put it in there, screw it back in after I cleaned it. So that's what this is. This is what we use for pistols. This is a percussion cap wrench, nipple wrench. For taking these nipples out and putting them back in. So this is now. This was then. This was then. What a difference, what a difference that made. And if you look at the book, Sand Creek, we've, we found the Lost Sand Creek book. They have some great illustrations of how these cannons were fired and what they fired and if you want to learn more about the cannons and uh, uh, howitzers and find out what they were shooting, uh, look at this book and look at these illustrations on how the projectiles were put together. There was spherical canister uh, and Oh, a lot of these balls right here, lead, lead balls, were in, in these projectiles and came out. You can tell, they're looking, at, looking at, at this one here. Look at all the dents on this one. So, if you want to find out more about the cannonballs and shrapnel, Get the book and read about it right here. I'd like to talk about some guns, if I may. Now, if you, if I may, read a little excerpt from from this book. And this is this is to certify that a old cabin ball gun was found in the year uh, 1891, west of the Indian, Indian battleground on Big Sandy Creek, uh, north of Shivington, Colorado. And this, this is all in, uh, history for me. And uh, the gun was made by the Star Arms and Star was a manufacturer of guns. This gun was patented in 1856. This gun, it's all, it's all talked about in the book. And for, if I can take just a second to show you, this is a reproduction weapon that it's, it's real. 
it's real. It will shoot real ammunition, but it is a reproduction. It's not like one, a gun that was found out of St. Kirk. This particular weapon is a 44 caliber cap and ball single action. It's not a double action like these other star guns talk about. And what's the difference between single action and double action? Well, if you notice, okay, single action, if I pull the hammer back, one click, one click, and now it's actually in a safety position, can't, can't pull the trigger, can't pull it, can't fire. Not until the hammer is completely pulled back all the way and then you re release the hammer by pulling the trigger. That's called single action. And a double action means that you can pull the trigger and when you pull the trigger, it, it will self-cock like these guns in, in the book are. And then when you pull the trigger all the way back, It'll fire the weapon. That's called a double action. Bang, 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 bang. Just by pulling the trick. Single action. And this particular model is a 44 caliber Remington. Exactly like they carried at Sanker. But it's a reproduction. You want to read more about what was found out there, please get this book, please. I've, I've been going through it myself and I'm, I'm a, completely amazed at what was, was found out there. And if you want to find out more history, real history, not reenactor's history, but the real history, please get this book. I'm looking at the gun that was found out there at St. Creek. And first of all, let me point out, it is a cap and ball, which means you had to have a percussion cap to fire this weapon. And those percussion caps went right there. You can see the nipples right there. The ramrod right there uh, would come off the barrel. Ram the ammunition into the cylinder, pack it down tight, and then put the ramrod back in position. It's still not ready to fire, not like, not like that weapon there. This, this weapon, first of all, has to be manual, manual operated. Remember, one click back, that's on safety. With one pull back, all the way, now it can shoot. That's single action. And that's what they had. That's what they were issued. Remington, 44 caliber, cap and ball. That's one type. If you read the book, you'll see the type of guns that they were using. Another gun very popular with the troops was called, this is called, and look at the difference between this gun and the one that was found. There's a lot of difference. Uh, look at the trigger guard and the frame going around the cylinder. This is called the 1860 Colt Army. And this was this was the gun that was issued. And a lot of the soldiers that fought at St. Kirk carried a weapon like this. The gun found in the in the book was a double action. And you know what the, what that double action 
is when you pull the trigger one and it goes in one click into the safety position and then you pull it all the way back now you can fire the weapon by releasing the hammer by pulling the trigger just like that and this is uh, what we use in reenacting but these are the, some of the types of guns used by reenactors Remington 44 caliber cap and ball single action 1858 by the way was when that was patented and then the 1860 Colt Army cap and ball these are very hard to load and that's why going into into a battle a lot of soldiers would carry two or three of these guns already loaded they could take the cylinder plumb out of these guns and they carried another spare cylinder already loaded already loaded already capped in a, in a little holster on, on their belt and they take it out and then replace this cylinder with a new with a new one and then go to fight during the time of sand creek you know they were using very primitive what i consider primitive weapons at that time uh, kept a ball some were double action but most of them were single action and once you once you shot six times you're done but the basic weapon at sand creek and if you read the book again please get this book please give it so you understand real history and if you uh, look at the type of weapons that we use as reenactors, these are all re replicas of real guns. But the real, the real guns are found, were found in the bullets and the buttons and the shrapnel, especially the, the shrapnel, were found buried in the sand over years and years of metal detecting. So please, please read this book and find out all the, all the hardships and sacrifices that the Bowen family went through to find these artifacts. And we are just touching the tip of the iceberg with, with everything that happened out there. So please, please read this book and find out what really happened. I know I'm not supposed to say this, and I'm not going to, but uh, when I first saw this shrapnel, there's quite a story behind that one. So if you want to find out more about that, it's in the book too. This gun is called a Star Revolver. And this gun belonged to Arthur Gibson and was used at St. Creek during the fight. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of this gun, but it is, it is in the book. It is in the book. So please read about this gun. This is this is history. This is real history. This is just reenacting. So this is the real gun right here. If you can see this. Okay, I'm sure you you're getting anxious to know what that last item was. This part right here. This is what brings it all together. This part right here. This is the top of the cannon 
on the projectile of a spherical case and with a timer, the timer went right here. See those grooves right there? It would screw in and you could set that timer to when you wanted, wanted that projectile to explode and the timer, which is right here, goes right here. And you see the grooves? It would screw into there. And you could set that timer to like two, that was two seconds after it was fired. You know. And this was found at the actual site, found out there, in a, and a lot of these were fired pretty close to each other. So if you want to find out more about that, get the book and read more about it what these fragments meant. Okay. Top of the, yeah. of the fuse right there. And I hope you can see the grooves that are in the, in the top of that part right there. Because the timer was screwing to the top Right here. And you can see this, the threads on this would fit right in here, screw into it. And then you could set this timer to go off whenever you want it. Want it to go off. One second, two seconds. And every time you set it for a, another second, you know, you're talking about more range. This is what defines everything that we that was found out there, and this this tells exactly where things happened out there, and by finding this stuff, stuff artifacts, artifacts, and. Uh, over years of metal detecting. And it's all wrapped up, gets all wrapped up in this book right here. And it talks about uh, mountain howitzers. This is just a, a model of the howitzer. And it took eight men to, fire gun. It, you know, you had men manning, swabbing the, the tube, men carrying ammunition around to the front, and then you had somebody that would take a long rammer, and a, gun, a soldier came around, placed projectile right there in the tube, and then the Another guy with a long rammer ran that down. So if you want more information about mountain howitzers, please get this book and read about what was found out there before I even saw any of these artifacts. Well, I looked at the artifacts one time and I pointed it out, military, military, and then the one piece blew my mind. And when I first saw that piece, if you want to know more, the rest of the story, get the book. It's in there. And that's the way it was. And that's the truth. To use a, a common phrase, by your leave, which was a common phrase used in, in the cavalry, by your leave, which means with your permission, I would like to thank the Bowen family, which 
means Chuck, Cher, and Michael for having me talk to you t today. And I would also like to thank the United States Cavalry Association for their support in all my talks and lectures. So, yeah, I get a little, a little upset sometimes. Lest we forget, until next time, I'll see you then.